So am I just, I'm talking into this fluff ball? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> The puff ball? Oh. Oh, okay. I feel like I'm like talking into a rabbit's butt or something. <laughs> Bloopers. Okay. All right, guys, welcome back to our YouTube channel. We are in a bit of a different atmosphere today. We are going to be doing a live voiceover um, clip of our glute and hamstring workout. We have not done one of these before, so you guys will have to let us know, give us feedback on like what the sound is like, if you guys like videos like this. But I have Madison here with Hello. me. You guys have, if, you, if you've watched our YouTube channel, we have interviewed her a few times. Um, Madison does have like a very specific focus in mobility, you're a mobility specialist, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, so we're gonna go through this workout. As most of you know, I am a competitor, so I am typically training for a very aesthetic purpose. And that doesn't always come with the most functional of form or functional of movements because I am in some areas trying to atrophy certain areas that you typically wouldn't want to atrophy for just like general health. Um, so Madison's gonna come in, kind of give her perspective on a movement. I'm gonna give mine. We're gonna kind of like learn from each other and just have a little bit of fun. Yeah, it's kind of like a bikini competitor meets a functional um, training coach, kind yeah. of merging our brains together. So it'll be kind of cool to see what comes out of it. Yeah, I'm excited. So again, this is like a new type of video. So if you guys like it, let us know in the comments below and we're gonna get into this workout. So the first movement we are going to start with today. So really the first thing we started with, we didn't video it, but just you wanna make sure that you're getting your body nice and warm before. So we're not training those muscles cold. I like foam rolling, or not foam rolling, lacrosse balling out my glutes to really release and really you felt my hip flexors. Yes. Really making sure I'm stretching out those hip flexors. But like a big thing you changed for me is I was always making sure I was doing mostly dynamic stretching, but you brought in the idea of static stretching and how that's kind of BS that like you can't static stretch first. So you kind of right. want to touch on that a little bit. Right, yes. So don't hate if this literature isn't perfect, but the study that was you saying static stretching decreases strength gains during a lift, like static stretching before, was based on a study where they were holding these stretches for like eight minutes in one position, which just isn't gonna happen before Most a typical don't even stretch, stretch their whole body for eight minutes. Correct. So it's like <laughs> What's the harm if you've been sitting at a desk all day with your hip flexors in a shortened position? Yeah. What's the harm of kneeling down and like reopening and re yeah. resetting what you did all day from sitting? So you're kind of more so just getting back to where you should be versus yeah. like stretching yourself beyond. Um, and then personally, I like to do a lot of like joint rotational work to heat up the joint capsule. Um, it almost like lubricates the joint so things flow better and it's really stimulating for the nervous system. Um, go on her IG. She, yes. I'll list all of her stuff <laughs> below too, but Where she's got great mobility stuff. Where we go for and all stuff. of that stuff. So yeah. yeah, we're just both like, our warm-ups aren't a set thing. It's specific to yeah. how we're feeling that, and day, that day and what we yeah, need. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so. And I was gonna say too, like you, it's more harm to come into a workout and just go into it cold, like you said sitting Absolutely. at a desk all day and those hip flexors are shortened and you just start squatting, you're not gonna yeah. get that full range of motion. If you're not getting that full range of motion, you're not getting the most out of that mm -hmm. exercise. You're not gonna get all the gains you're going in for it for. Absolutely. So our first exercise is going to be a glute ham slide. So this is a great um, alternative for like a hamstring curl. And for me, this is actually newer to me, so you may be more of like an expert, but the few times I've done it, I feel it a lot more, a lot stronger in that glute tie in and like upper hammy than like the lying leg curl that we have, which is gonna be more in that low hamstring hang. So I'm gonna let, I'm gonna be demoing it. I'm gonna let Madison walk you through it because again, she has done this a lot more often than I have and she's actually helped me with my form. So we will start with having her walk through it. Perfect. What do you call this? I don't know. Glute hand slide. Okay, I call it just like the roller hamstring curl. So what's cool about this is we're loading your hamstrings with max hip extension. So you really need to focus on that. Max hip extension, not back extension, hip extension. So a big thing Danielle's gonna do first is make sure her low back is pressing down into the ground. So there's almost like a good connection between her hip and her rib. And then as she digs her heels down into that slider, her hips should extend off the ground as she curls in. And you notice that her pelvis is not rotating at all. She's keeping that tuck, her glutes are on fire. Yep, and then she's gonna straighten back out. If this is new, it helps to like go down and reset every time just to really make sure you have a good grab on those glutes and hamstrings. The next thing I'd focus on is keeping your toes straight up and down. If the target is to get the back of your hamstrings, 
you need your toes to be straight up and down. If you're rotating your toes out, that load is gonna migrate to the outside of your leg, maybe even like your quadriceps. So keeping those toes straight up and down is also super helpful here. Slow, steady, get in there and enjoy the burn. Okay, so a couple other details when you're doing this. Um, don't mind me, last set, I'm dying right now. Um, but hands down versus up, I like to roll up. It helps roll your shoulder blades back and down. Again, like helping promote anatomical position while you're doing this. Like, it's an easy tendency to want to crunch to help keep your core engaged while you go through this. But then you think of real life when you're standing tall, are you gonna be able to keep your core engaged? Probably not, because you don't train like that. So it's important to find like good posture for your chest and your arms, and then from there try to find your life. A lot harder, but more relevant to real life. Then you come up, pull in, come out, down. Another thing with that is paying attention to where your weight goes when you're doing this. A lot of times we see people hike their hips up, and all their weight like comes up towards their head, which tells me they're hip hiking and using their low back again. So it's like, pack your shoulders in, flatten out your back, and then dig your feet down into the roller. Dig down into the roller, and only go as high up as you can without that weight shifting to your head. And then you pull it in. Push it out. Feet down. So as I'm doing this, I'm digging my heels like I'm trying to break through the floor. The whole time, oh my goodness. As we mentioned, we are doing a glute and hamstring workout. This is specifically from my programming, um, and my coach has this in there for, it specifically hits like for bikini, that glute hammy tie-in area. And a lot of people are like, how do I work that muscle? It's not necessarily a specific muscle group. It's where the glutes and hamstrings meet. And so this is really able, you want me to like, right there. So it, this is really able, you're really able to get deep up into those hamstrings and those glutes. And like she, like Madison mentioned, because we're up in that glute or that hip extension, you are working your glutes at the same time. We're in like a lying hamstring curl or a seated hamstring curl. Those glutes are a little bit more turned off because we're not having to keep our hips up in that extension. Nice. That's a good point to make is like, when you see other people doing a movement, you think like, oh, I need to go into that full extension as well. But everybody's biomechanics and like strengths are so much different. Like yeah. my hips didn't, like they were probably off the mat like that much, but I was able to get way more hamstring recruitment. Right. So just because you see someone doing a movement a certain way, doesn't mean it's gonna be best for you to do it Absolutely. that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so the next move we are going to do is going to be glute focused hyper extensions. So most of you may know this as like a back extension machine, but we are gonna use it specifically for the glutes and in my training, specifically for those upper glutes. So you want that, that shelf. Cause I think a lot of people too, when they say they, oh, I wanna grow my glutes, they're really focused on like the lower glute, but to really get that like bubble look, you gotta train the upper and the outer. I'm gonna do four sets of 20 and then three, or sorry, one set of 20 body weight and then three sets of 15 with the weight. And then the last set I'm gonna drop down to body weight after that and go till failure. So do you kind of want to talk about what you use it for, for your yeah. clients? So similar, like everything bodybuilders do, like it's yeah. still working those muscle groups for my clientele as well. This is a really, really good one in like a substitution for like a dumbbell RDL, yeah. a deadlift or anything like that because you can do it body weight and it takes a lot of tension off the spine. Yeah. So it's a way to load the glutes and hamstrings without putting any compression on the discus of the spine. Um, and I found it really helpful for people just to learn how to RDL and yeah. get those muscles going. So yeah. I also like, so I like using it either in the beginning for like an activation movement or even at the end, I really like ending my glute, glute workouts with a good hamstring stretch because I do tend to get like really balled up and tight in my hamstrings. So making sure at the end of my workouts, I'm getting a good stretch in them. So I'm not ending in like super balled up position. Mm -hmm. These are really great, I think for that as well. Yeah, and another addition to that, like for the end of a workout, say you started with a heavy hip thrust, some RDLs, a deadlift of some sort, maybe a back squat. That's a lot of load on your spine and your spine only has so much endurance. All those little tiny muscles around your spine are actually endurance muscles, so they will fatigue out. Um, so this is a really safe way if you have a little more left in those hamstrings to go hard. I love it. Like, safely, so. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then adding, I like just for this one specifically because this pad is so long, I like putting this foam roller behind my feet so I can still get my feet a little bit higher um, and not lock it out at the bottom and put a lot of strain. But if it doesn't have that foam roller, I just don't feel super stable. I feel like my feet are gonna slip. So that's why you're gonna see the foam roller. I've seen you use like the yoga pads as yeah. well with your clients. I think it just depends how tight how you thick are. you need it, yeah. And then. And then we may need, you may see us moving this because for me, I really like that pad right at like the top of my hip hip and as you can see our height's a little bit so different we're so bit. we're gonna probably have to adjust that depending on who's doing the movement so i will stop i'm gonna talk while she does this so you can see yes this is a back extension machine but she's doing the furthest thing from that which is the goal because we're trying to target the legs so you can see she's kind of initiating the movement by driving her thighs into the pad so it's almost like she's hip thrusting into the pad and as a result her body lifts up so she's not really focusing on lifting her torso up at all. She's focusing on pushing her ankles into that roller and her thighs into the pad to initiate the hamstrings and the glutes. And the torso just goes along for the ride. And again, that's why it's so safe for the back. It's just keeping a strong core and then driving through the legs. Okay, so now she's doing the loaded set, but you can see like we talked about earlier, this roller helps line her up so her whole thigh is on that pad and she can drive. Where before, like only like her pocket up was really pressing. Um, and again, that would stimulate maybe a little cheating and using the low back to get up. So that just gives a good firm contact. And you can see she's almost crunching her core as she comes up to really avoid any extension of those back erectors. Nice. Oh, I already feel like the workout should be over. Yeah. Yep. Jen. It's all Jen's fault. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, because what she was saying, like if you're fully extended, you have to fight to keep these lats engaged instead of letting them protract and pull those shoulders forward. Which is a big no-no on yes. like an RDL. So if you, no -no. if you let them be protracted here, it's just gonna teach bad habits in your other lifts. And there's different ways that you can add load to this exercise. This is just one of them. You could hold a plate. You could also add a band, so having the band around these and putting it kind of around that upper back or even just holding it in front. So finding what way, and honestly, if you do enough time under tension, kind of like Madison was having me slow down that contraction, you don't even need to wait this exercise. No, no. Not at all. And don't wait it until you've got the form down. Suggestion, Yeah. if you're not already, without moving your feet, imagine like corkscrewing your feet yeah. into that. Do you already do yes. that? Good, so that's something you can't really see happening. Um, but Danielle's that's thinking of like exactly. screwing her feet into the platform, especially with trying to get the outer glute area. That screwing aspect will really help get in there and create a lot of tension in that hip joint. Um, this can be used for a hip thrust, um, which Susie and I talked about last week. Um, it can be used on an RDL. Even a single leg RDL, you wanna think of that femur externally rotating as you go through this motion. Another good point too, like Madison's not used to doing high reps. So like, just because you have a, a workout that set, has a specific amount of reps in it, just use those reps as a guide. Like if you start feeling your form fail, you're done. Like, don't, don't go just because you're like, oh, I'm supposed to do 15, but your back's on fire. Like, Right. There's no point of doing loaded that. loaded and you can't get through it. Yeah. Obviously, you should go to a lower weight in that, in that time. Huh. Ooh. Corks through is like the exact description I use for my clients. That's perfect. Yeah. It's, it's Leather. <laughs> the last thing you'd wear for a workout. So as we mentioned, there's different ways that you can weight this exercise. Madison's using a plate. She really likes it a lot closer to her chest. And that could even, for some people, that could even help with that rounding of that upper back to keep us from keeping it in those glutes and not letting it come into that lower back. And I'm not sure if she brought this up too, but I also like to think about bracing my core as I come up too to really keep it out of that low back. 
I'm just having a little bit of a groin issue there. There we go. Oh. <laughs> And okay. I think that's a good point too. Like you can stop mid set and fix your yeah. like you, you don't feel like it's hitting. My just glutes right. weren't firing because yeah. there was a point on the pad hitting me in a very uncomfortable way, so I like couldn't focus on a contraction. Because you're gonna get more out of doing like 11 reps this way than continuing to do the 15 where you're not feeling it. One more. Nice. Oh my gosh. Okay. Something, something I wanted to mention, but like I couldn't talk. <laughs> Tempo is like a thing that you try to keep during a lift, but as things get heavy, there's like no shame in slowing down that tempo a little bit. As coaches, this up. I'll get it. <laughs> Nails. But as coaches, we would both agree, like we'd rather see you slow way down and like get those reps perfect oh, at the yeah. end, then like forced to maintain like a down two up and hold type thing if you're like arching your back and cheating. So yeah. no shame in like plowing through the mud kind of and going slow and steady with it. So yeah, that was that exercise. Now we're both dead and we have more to go. <laughs> As you can probably guess, uh, the next thing we are going to do is a hip thrust and definitely a staple in a glue, or, glue and hamstring workout for me because it definitely does work both. Um, so we are doing it, if you guys have trained here, we do have a glute, um, or sorry, glute. We have a hip thrust machine, but we are going to be doing a barbell hip thrust. I do think that like personally, nothing's gonna beat a barbell hip thrust because you can adapt the length to fit again your biomechanics where on a machine it's very set. So it's not gonna be perfect for everyone. It is nice because <laughs> you don't have to set it up, but this is a great way if you are training here because we do not have a like, specific area for hip thrust. This is a great way to set it up using these rogue boxes. Uh, barbell, we do have a shorter barbell as well for hip thrust that I'll use sometimes, but this is just the standard squat barbell. And again, you'll see us adjusting the height of this because Madison is taller, I am shorter. So we're adjusting it based on our bodies and what feels right. And another thing to add with this setup, all the things she said I completely agree with, another benefit to using a barbell versus a machine that's like on a guide is you're required to make sure this bar stays level, yes. which doesn't seem like much of a thing, but just that lateral stability asks a lot more of all the muscles involved, in turn giving you more muscle gains. So. Yeah and more like nervous system connection and things like that. And again, like I that, think a so. lot of people will want to use the machine because again, they don't have to use that stability and they can go heavier on the machine. Whereas this one kind of checks your ego a little bit and makes you really work yeah. all of those muscles. So if you're so. training to like move well, um, avoid injury or just like an athlete, like trying to perform better, this would be the way to go. If you're going for aesthetics and like a good pump, the machine yeah. will get the job done for you yeah. for sure. So let's all do right. it. Let's do it. So Danielle's about to take off. Um, you can see her foot position has her heels right under her knees. With this, she's gonna have a lot of focus on the hip extension, a lot of load on those glutes. If she walked her feet out a little further, so they were extended from her knees, she'd get a lot more hamstring involved. Granted, she's still getting a lot of hamstring in this movement, um, but getting more glute out of it for this situation. Um, again, if she walked those feet out a little further, it would be a lot of hamstring action. You can also see bar placement on the hips. You can see the peak of her glute and the bar are in line with each other. So if you're ever questioning if it should be like more on your thigh, more on your pelvis, like find the peak of your glutes and put the bar directly above that. All right, so as you can see, Madison's got a bit of a narrower stance than me, but again, that's gonna be what feels best for you and where you're gonna feel that glute recruitment the most. And you can see at the top, she's coming straight up to tabletop position and not thrusting past that. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes I see on hip thrust because it does have the word thrust in it and a lot of people are thrusting as high as they can and they end up hyperextending through the low back. And that's why a lot of people complain that they have back pain when they have glute workouts. You should never have any pain in your back during a glute workout. So the biggest tip I like to do in glute movements is talk about a pelvic tuck versus a pelvic thrust. So do you wanna do a pelvic thrust? Sure. So, like the bad way? Yeah. Yeah, so people think like get high, get more 
Yeah. And that's all in your low back. Her glutes are completely turned off at that point. Yep, there's that tuck. Yep. So keeping it, and again, that's gonna vary for everyone. Everyone's range of motion is going to be different. And as you can see too, her whole body's moving. She's not breaking at that rib cage. Yep. She's like a pendulum. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna add some weight. Awkward intermission. Where's Danielle? Where'd Danielle go? Oh, to get more weight? Classic. If you ever can't find Danielle, she's probably finding more weight to load. Okay, so Danielle thinks I can handle the same weight. Um, I cannot in like a hypertrophy focus, but I can in maybe like a power strength focus. So what I'm gonna be doing differently is setting the bar down between each rep, not holding at the top so the tempo will be up, down, pause, up, down, pause. This will make sure that I get up by driving my feet down into the ground and that rest will allow a little bit of like rest for the spinal cord so that endurance doesn't have to be in as long. Like her endurance is so high because she trains hypertrophy and that's amazing. Me, like I couldn't support and keep my midline brace for that long without like resting at the bottom. So we'll kind of show what that's about. Can you go up? And I think this is just another great example of adapting your training based on your goals, A, and B, what your body is capable of. Because I think a lot of people too, they do think about, this is something that Dom has taught me, they think about going through that full range of motion on a hip thrust and coming all the way down. And sometimes if you have a shorter glute muscle, that's taking it way past your range of motion. And that's when people let it go into that lower back. But because Madison is a taller individual, and we're on that shorter box, she is able to go all the way down without extending through that low back to get to the bottom of the range of motion. You got this. Power through those heels. You're fine. Yes. Nice, brace. And you'll notice every time before she goes up, she is taking that big brace into that core which that big brace in that core is gonna take any of that pressure off that low back to get that bar off the ground. It's okay. Um, something to add for that too for my training. Um, I'm doing her bikini workout, but I made that switch versus just backing up the weight and maintaining hypertrophy too. Um, I'm a trail runner, a hiker, and just a distance runner. So having some of that explosiveness for running uphill is helpful. So that that's a good, exercise for that while well, I'm out of breath and that was only like eight reps but just another way to do it mm -hmm. okay. right yes ready to go into their next set like right away there you want to rest so you can give every single set your intensity because if you think about it, if you're only taking 30 seconds in between sets like this you're never going to be able to get that rep count that you want or give it your full intensity because you're not allowing those muscle fibers to recover yeah obviously i'm not saying rest 10 minutes but like two minutes, like give yourself like two, yeah. two minutes, 90 seconds to two minutes. There's energy systems that become de depleted and you can't force those systems to like replenish themselves. You have to wait. So how many reps here? Eight to ten. Eight to ten. But I'm gonna try to keep that tension. So think of like, Pushing up, pulling down. I like think of pulling the floor to you. So she's gonna work on eccentric control even more this time. 
So obviously she has an awesome drive through the floor to get up, but also thinking of being connected on the way down. And it doesn't mean you have to go much slower, but almost think of your feet being glued to the ground and you're pulling your feet off the floor as you come down. Yeah, there we go. So maybe even a little hip flexor involvement to control that glute lowering. Yes, so good. Done, done. So you could see at the end there too, like her hips like could not fully extend. She was dead, but she was smart. She slowed down and just like continued pushing downward and did not lose that tuck. Like instead of forcing height that she knew her hips could go to before, she like listened and was like, well, my hips are not going up. I'm gonna stop here and drop back down. Versus forcing that height that she thought she needed to get. Nice job. Dead, fire. Okay. Eight reps. You got this, girl. Good core brace. Nice. Nice. Oh. Your ham, your Dead. hamstring hang is nice. Is it? That's best with the big jiggle right at the bottom. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's why you get the big, like, big uh. jiggle. <laughs> Done with that, right? I got one more. Oh yeah. Wait, didn't you start? You yeah, started. but I've only done two sets of this way. Okay. Show this? Yeah. So what are we doing? Just gonna put the 25 under here. I can show it from my side. Yeah. All right, friends. Little pro tip so you don't waste your energy or get hurt unloading. You've probably seen this before, but if not, we just gotta make sure you know about it. Put your lighter weight there, or just grab like a 10 off the ramp. Line it up with the inside dumbbell, and then roll it up here, and then you can pull your weight off with ease without fighting for your life off the ground with it. That's all. So I have RDLs next, let's just keep this up. Not with this weight, but yeah. Okay. Uh, let's keep 145. So next we are going to move on to a barbell um, RDL, so Romanian deadlift. You can do this on a lot of different setups in the gym. Um, again, the barbell is gonna be like Madison pointed out. It's gonna bring on those stabili stabilizers and kind of engage those as well. Um, I like barbell, I just feel more in control with a barbell. You can do dumbbells, you can do it on the T-bar row, I've done it here. Where else do you do it with? Yeah, low cable pull-throughs. Again, it's, a, it's just another alternative to similar to those hyperextensions. You're just getting that good stretch in your hamstrings. And the biggest thing with RDLs is you're not using your back to come up. You're getting, getting that stretch and corkscrewing those feet and pulling those glutes underneath. And I think one of the biggest mistakes I see is people coming all the way through too far, going into that low back. So making sure we're coming down and you only have to come down like right below those knees till you feel that stretch. I also see people go down way too far. They lose that contraction in their lats yeah. and, it, and then they come up and then they come back too far. And that's yeah. part of the reason why you get that pain so in your low back. talk about a visual yeah. with that hinge. You stay there, that was perfect. Stand yep. sideways. So start to hinge. So it's not necessary. It is about feeling too, but go ahead and go back, go back. See how her butt's pushing back? We're focusing on the back. Once she can't go back, she stops. Yeah. Once she hits that back area, if she tried to go any lower, she would load. And you see how that angle of the spine changed? So you only go as far as you can go back while keeping that spine position, then you pull through that stretch. You see that I added a belt to this um, exercise because another thing when you're coming up, you really want to make sure you get that strong core brace. And I really like personally having that belt to kind of brace against. It just gives me a really good like visual for that brace. And I also like, because I'm not really concerned about my grip strength, I like using bracelets. And this is pretty heavy weight, to be honest. Like, the grip will help her handle this weight. Like, there gets a point where your hamstrings obviously are gonna develop faster than your hand strength can handle. And that's where you can use some grips here. It's also gonna help her keep her lats engaged a lot better too because her ha hands aren't like slipping. So she can still keep like a firm grip on the bar and keep those lats fired up. So again, you can see She's only pushing back as far as she can. 
not reaching down, she's thinking of sending those hips back. You can see she's almost like hitting a wall at the top so she doesn't end up overextending, pushing through those heels. Good. Yeah, any further, she'd start to arch at that low back. So again, there's a little wall with the core there at the top. Lightweight. <laughs> dumbbells for them and I was telling Susie about this while Danielle was grabbing her wrist straps um, we were talking about like muscle capacity and mm -hmm. its load-bearing capacity so for example like we are very different sizes and maybe for example we both have let's say 120 pounds of lean muscle yeah. mass I don't know where you're at but even though we have the <laughs> same exact say we might have the same amount of lean muscle mass that doesn't um, reflect our strength yep. so say she's 120 I'm 120 and we have like millions of synapses in our body. And she maybe uses like 80% of those synapses and maybe I only use 45% of them. Just from like lack of training. Like you train more, you yeah. learn how to use those more. We um, also train, we're training for different purposes. Like right. you yeah. again, you're a runner, so you're yeah. training for a different purpose. I'm a physique athlete, so I'm training for a different mm -hmm. purpose. And you have low back issues, so that's yeah. something that you're training around as well. True. So there's different ways, and I think that's where so many people get caught up on like, oh, we're, I'm training for strength, so that means I have to lift heavy, heavy, heavy. Mm -hmm. A line that Dave uses with me sometimes that has always stuck with me is like, you can make lightweight heavy. Oh, yeah. It's just a matter of how you go about it and like the different intensity techniques you use, the different time under tension techniques you mm -hmm. use and stuff like yeah. that so like you're right I, you told me I could handle this weight and I could but I probably wouldn't use the proper yeah. muscle groups the whole time where she is so developed in her rear chain yeah. that she can just rip through that weight no problem yeah me like my muscle groups are a lot different because I run and I'm not as focused on that so it's not going to be the same and so I could look at this and be like well why can't I do that she can do it and I'm a bigger person than her but it's not about that it's about like your personal body knowing your body like yeah. that's the one key thing like listen to your body so there she goes, hinging back, keeping that back nice and flat. And then she's bracing up, not coming past that range of motion in the front. And again, like we've mentioned a few times, and you can't notice it as much, but both of us are really thinking as we come up, we're corkscrewing those heels into the ground and externally rotating those knees. And I like to think about breathing out as I come up, because a lot of people too will forget to breathe. And you can see she's keeping those lats nice and locked in. You can also even see her toes kind of like coming up a little bit well, as she sits back into her heels, just shows how much she's putting that weight into that posterior chain. On yeah. It? Your shin angle. Do you ever pay attention to your shin angle? No. When you RDL? No. So your, your hinge, like everything is amazing, but I notice, and I guess you can film this, as you go back, your shins go back, and as you come forward, your shins come forward, and just oh. that little movement mm -hmm. is taking away tension. from the tension that could be back okay. there. Okay. So what you can do is imagine you stepped in like knee high cement. Well, not knee high, but like shin high cement and it dried. So your legs are literally stuck in place. She's a stud, so she'll probably change and do it perfectly right away. Let's find out. All right, so they're set in cement. See how they go back a little bit as she goes down. But then it's important they just don't shift forward excessively. That's better. Nice. Okay. I want the microphone close to my face so they can hear my screams. All right, so I took over for the last thing we're doing. So we could have done instead, um, I think it was like some straight leg abductions was, on the no, cable. It was, uh, we were gonna do, well, we were gonna do cable hip abduction, so just straight out to the side and then superset it with uh, 
Smith Machine hyperextension, so where we're on and we're pushing that Smith Machine up. Right, okay, so we're kind of combining like a straight hip extension and abduction into one exercise yeah. here. These are called prone alternating straddle runners. You can do these bilaterally as well. We're doing single leg um, just to help ring out each leg. A lot of people are a little uneven with their um, muscle groups. So you can see Danielle is driving her pelvis down into the box and she's trying to find that outermost range of motion of her hip. So she's not just trying to extend super high through that hip, she is finding the widest that femur can go relative to her hip joint and then extending as long as she can. So she's almost thinking of pushing towards my hand, up and out and driving through the heel. Just like all of our other lifts, she's pushing through that heel. Nice control. This one's pretty intense by itself, not much weight needed, um, especially because we're trying to find that outermost range of motion. If you feel like you could do a lot of weight with this, you're probably not finding that outer range enough. Like she, right now, she almost feels like there's like a scraping in that ball and socket of her hip. Oh, Good job. <laughs> oh. Yeah, so a big thing when I'm doing it is just like, and it's kind of like we brought it up on the hip thrust machine. You want to think about tucking that pelvis into this bench. So really kind of thinking about bringing that pelvis into neutral. So many of us walk around with that anterior pelvic tilt and we let that remain in our exercises. And that's when you start to feel that lower back pain because you're letting those hips come back and all that stress is going into that low back. So when you're tucking that pelvis into neutral, it's in turn taking all of that tension off that low back. Nice. So form looks great. I want you guys to look at this and then imagine what a sumo deadlift looks like. Very similar movement. I know she's doing single leg right now, but you can imagine if this was bilateral, like both legs at the same time. Very similar setup in like bottom position. Scraping that outer range of motion, a lot of external rotation of that thigh. So if you're a sumo deadlifter or power lifter, this is a great exercise to consider to help stimulate that hip joint to be used to the movement and move more fluidly through the movement. Would you do this, um, could this be a good like pre-exhaustion exercise or just activation exercise or would you typically put it at the end of a workout? I would put it at the beginning depending on the person. Um, personally, I would do it before I started doing the sumo deadlifts, not three sets, maybe one good set of like eight each side, like as hard as I could go to stimulate the hips to teach them that they should be going yeah. into that range of motion. And like watch that and see where you can go because when you sumo deadlift, the weight's a lot heavier and can pull you into positions that you shouldn't be going into. So this is a good way to like teach your body where it should be going as well. So love it. Good question. Yes, good. Good for activation, for We're sure. Doing three sets or four? Um, what do you think? I was supposed to do four, so I'm gonna do, do four. four. Yeah. Okay, here we go. I don't drink uh, stimulants pre-workout. No, no pre-workout. No. I do a vasodilator. <laughs> A pickle? I love that. Well, I do feel like my pre-workout is ground beef and rice. And so I put like a little... <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> my pre-workout is ground beef and rice. And so I'll put a pick, I'll cut up a pickle for the sodium. But then it's like a burger bowl. 
Yeah. And I eat it with, uh, it's very specific. You need to go to Safeway and get their sweet and spicy, the Safeway brand mustard. It's like a spicy thousand island. Ooh. And it's like zero calorie everything. Oh. And then I put like a little shredded lettuce in it and I just mix it all up and it's like a little burger bowl. And then you get the sodium for the pumps. That's you awesome. get the carbs from the white rice. You got the protein and a little bit of fat from the ground beef. Nice. How early or how soon do a workout do you? I do like an hour to an hour and a half. I'll eat that. And then um, I actually, because my calories are pretty high right now, I get three rice cakes pre-workout too. So I'll eat those like 15 minutes before just because those digest so easily. Yeah. So I'm feeling all the pumps right now. What do, what do you eat pre-workout? So I don't eat like a pre-workout. I, because I'm a trainer and I have flexibility in my life, I just try to get my workout in like no more than like three hours beyond the last time I ate. If that makes sense, sorry, I'm so far. Um, so if it's three, do you find yourself like, if you if it's been two hours, do you find yourself like lagging at the end of a workout? Because you're, um, do you ever do an intro? I do not, no. And I don't know if I train hard enough to do that, to be honest, yeah. but for example, um, say I had like four clients in a row, like I ate my breakfast, I had four clients in a row, I'd probably go home, like wait to have lunch, and then train like an hour after I've had lunch, so you do, if you that never... makes sense. So I don't tweak, I don't tweak my nutrition for my training just because it's not as regimented for me. I try to just train around my eating times, if that makes sense. But that that goes to say like sometimes I do have a really tight schedule and my only training time is a weird hour. I will pack something like carb based to eat a little bit before my workout. That's what I was gonna ask. Yeah, I was gonna it's like... usually carbohydrate focused, especially if it's for a run. If it's for a lift, maybe something a little bit more well-rounded, but usually always carbs, especially if you're not starving and you just need enough to not feel like dizzy or fatigued. It's a carb-based well, thing. Your body yeah. is using the carbs during the workout. Like right. that's, that's what it's breaking down for fuel. And if you don't have carbs in your system, it's gonna naturally go to your muscle to break it down to fuel the workout if you're not properly yeah. fueled. It, yeah, that's true. And it's like depending on the exercise too. Yeah, like and what you're I can get away with it a little bit with my runs if I don't have enough food in me because that style of training pulls nat like will start pulling from your fat sources your fat. a little bit better. So you can you feel that like energy shift happen during your runs if I've ran out of carbs, I feel terrible. Okay, now I'm like starting to use different um, energy systems to make this run happen. You just can't be as explosive on your run. It'd be hard to like run uphill. It's fine for like a flat, slow run type of thing. I so. was speaking specifically for like weight training. Yeah, weight training. Yeah, um, yeah definitely don't want to be past like two hours from a last meal or I'm feeling the suffrage for sure. Yeah. <laughs> your workout will suffer from that yes. too. Yes, exactly. All right, last thing. Yes, eight each side, and then she's gonna just bilaterally extend out only as far as she can to maintain like a good feeling in the glute. And she's just gonna kind of hold it to failure just because it's her last thing of the day. It'll be nice and fun. I'm gonna set this here. That's all she wrote. Yeah, my glutes are done. Jen, is it? Huh? Speaking of Jen. Yes. That's all Jen wrote. She did. Well, she did have some calf raises, but I'll do those later. <laughs> um, but thank you guys for joining. If you guys like this type of workout, definitely let us know and we can do more. If you have any specific questions about the exercise we did, um, leave them down below and Madison and I will get back to answering those questions. And if you guys have any, um, sorry, I'm still trying to catch my breath, requests for the next video, definitely let us know and we will see you guys in the next one. Truck? If you're looking for a uh, Chevy <laughs> Silverado, <laughs> hit me up, <laughs> please. <laughs> that should start the video with no context. If you're